my good friend and uh, senior horticulturist here at Juniper Level Botanic Garden, Doug Ruhren, yesterday um, asked me why in the world do white top pitcher plants produce so many pitchers towards the end of summer into autumn? And there's a very good reason for that. And it's not the only pitcher plant that produces new pitchers in the early autumn. Um, we're going to look at two that specialize in producing the bulk of their pitchers at this time of year. Um, certainly, the white top produces the best pitchers in late summer through autumn. In the spring, they'll put up one or two, but in the autumn, they just look spectacular. Why? Well, it has to do with the specialization that each species of pitcher plant has um, towards capturing its prey. Remember, these are carnivorous plants, so they need to attract, trap, um, and, and then uh, consume. They need to dissolve away and in, into the insect and then absorb those nutrients, right? And so the first step is how do you attract them? Well, white top pitcher plants have nectar glands, both on the top of the pitcher and around the outside. And that nectar, you'll see even on these, like the, right now, lots of carpenter bees are up there nectaring on that. And if you look at them, they get a little groggy as they're um as they're nectaring that's because this plant produces coneine which is the same chemical that's found in poison hemlock the same thing that killed socrates and for an insect what that does is it makes them loopy makes them groggy narcoleptic and they fall down in and have a hard time escaping because they've been drugged but that's not the primary thing that white top pitcher plants are after and their nectar is not the only way that they attract things because they're white at night, the moonlight, the starlight, all of the ambient uh, lights from the universe are shining down and lighting this up. And as a consequence, when we cut into one of these in the autumn, we see what it's been capturing. And usually we're going to find a bee or two in here too, so we're going to be careful as we start to open this up because the living things are usually at the top. Oh, not in this one though. This one actually has bees in it. Quite a few bees have been attracted to the nectar. But then as we look down in, we should find... <laughs> we find that this one didn't behave anywhere near like every other one that I've cut open this year. <laughs> this one is full of bees. And typically what you'll find in here, not so many bees, but more moths. Let's see if we can find another one, cut it open and look to see the moths. This is kind of interesting though, if some of the rest of you want to take a look. That one apparently attracted honeybees. And that's, honeybees are a great prey item for these guys because um, honeybees and ants, almost all uh, pitcher plants will attract ants. And both of those types of insects will, um, tell their sisters how to find the nectar source. So the first honeybee that found the nectar probably went back and told all the other honeybees and filled up the pitcher with honeybees. But let's see if this one has. Yesterday's worked so good when I cut it open for Doug. And there we go. If we look deep down into this one's pitcher, you can see it started out at least capturing moths because the moths are drawn to the light that's reflected off of that pitcher. So you don't even have to make the nectar. This one looks like um, the honeybees found that one too, but it's got a good number of moths in there too. So it's really a moth specialist and that's why. So why would you produce all of these hoods at the end of the summer and the beginning of the autumn? Well, you do that because at that time of year, we have probably the largest numbers built up over the summer of flying insects that are gonna hit that at night. And they're certainly the largest numbers of a lot of the nectaring insects um, towards the end of the summer, a lot more than we see in April or May when the first pitchers are produced. But the one over here is a really, really interesting. This is Saracenia alata, which grows, um, it's from the West Gulf Coastal Plain. And alata just means tall. And if you look at this, it doesn't have the biggest pitcher but it produces these incredibly tall pitchers um, and lots of them produced at the end of the summer and the beginning of the autumn. And this one produces nectar like the others and its nectar is incredibly attractive to one particular type of insect. 
And that's why this one produces these large pitchers in the autumn. And it's, it's really, at least the ones I've looked at yesterday, were really amazing when I cut into them because they specialize in collecting wasps. And one wasp in particular tends to be the one that's collected. And you can see them still flying out, trying to fly out um, as we cut down into here. This is absolutely stacked as full as you can get with yellow jackets all the way down. And yellow jackets um, come to nectar sources. They, you know, if you have a, a picnic or something, you'll see yellow jackets are one of the main things that, that are scavenging around the, um, the campsite or the picnic table. And um, they also come to any wasps that were connect, collected early on, because down in here you can see there's more than just yellow jackets in here, and the yellow jackets maybe weren't as numerous in the first part of the year when this thing started collecting insects, but they're also attracted to carrion. Um, so being scavengers, you have two modes to get them in here. You do it with the nectar, and then you do it with the dead bodies of your victims that you're dissolving away to get at their protein, to get at the, at the nitrogen that'll be converted into useful forms of protein by the protease that the plant actually secretes. So why produce so many pitchers in the fall? Because when do you always find the yellow jacket nests? Yellow jacket nests are always in the early to late autumn. And so that's the time when this plant really needs to be producing these hoods. And look at the amount of nectar that this thing is. You can see it glistening off of this. It's absolutely um, just covered with nectar just inside the deadly mouth of the thing, right? Right inside the tube um, to entice things to go in. And this one, like all of these pitcher plants now we know, produces coneyene, which is going to drug those insects as well, make them groggy and um, lead to their uh, very quick demise. <laughs> um, so one of the interesting things uh, about pitcher plants that people have gotten into is, is breeding hybrid pitcher plants. And a lot of the hybrids combine the characteristics of other uh, of their parent species. So this, for instance, is a hybrid between a white top pitcher plant, but it's not white enough to reflect light, and a purple pitcher plant. Purple pitcher plants just collect water and drown tiny insects by attracting them through their um, uh, nectar. But when we look inside of hybrid pitcher plants, what we find is that the mechanism of the trap itself has been completely obliterated by the hybridization event. And we don't find these being successful at gathering insects whatsoever. And so all pitcher plants will hybridize to produce some horticulturally stunning things. But no matter which ones we look at, and I'll show you one other over here, it looks like it should be a great plant for trapping insects. Look at this crazy hybrid involving Saracenia cytosina and white top pitcher plant. And it's white. Will it attract enough, uh, reflect enough light to uh, attract moths? Well, even if it did, it has the hood and the small opening of the um, parrot pitcher plant. And when we look inside this hybrid, we'll find that it's caught one fly, maybe two, right? Not very successful because the mechanisms that each of these plants have evolved over thousands or even maybe hundreds of thousands of years to trap insects has been broken by the hybridization event. And so even though the horticultural things are beautiful and we can grow them in horticulture in the wild, when we have a hybridization event, because these pitcher plants grow in very nutrient poor soils where they need the extra nitrogen that they get from the insects, the hybrids generally aren't as successful or as competitive as the pure species. And that's kind of probably how we avoid seeing hybrids take over in the wild, even when we have three or four or five species of pitcher plants growing together. So if you wanna see the trapping mechanisms, get species. You can get cultivars of the species, but if we get hybrids, you're probably not gonna see quite a, the excellent rate of trapping insects because the trap in a hybrid is just broken. Yeah, 
they'd still produce the digestive enzymes. Okay. So I just got it all over my hands. And, and there was the question about uh, these holes. In the, <coughs> of the, the holes are very interesting. So there's always something smarter than the trap. And most of the holes that are chewed in the sides of the pitchers are chewed by a particular wasp species called Isodontia philadelphica. It's the pitcher plant wasp. They're a long-legged um, wasp that real dark, shiny black. And the female goes in here and lays her eggs and on top of the dead stuff. And the developing larvae are going to eat. They're going to parasitize and eat the, the things that are in here. There's a number of insects that actually do this in pitcher plants. But then when the, the, the wasp larva is just like a little maggot that can kind of whoosh, worm around and move through the dead stuff and can move all the way up the pitcher to where the end of these little felt like downward pointing hairs are, but it can't climb up the slick waxy surface. And so what they end up doing instead of getting out by climbing or flying, they chew a hole in the side, drop out on the ground, pupate in this little wasp cocoon, and then emerge as the next generation of, of pitcher plant wasps that'll seek out another pitcher plant. Now, a lot of these, the Isodontia philadelphica will actually um, stuff grass in here um, also as a barrier um, to keep the uh, keep keep it kind of safe. Yeah, so it's, it's really cool. It is. Yeah, always something smarter than the pitcher. And there's actually even a mosquito species that you can only find in purple pitcher plant water where the digestive enzymes are. So even though there's protease, um, esterase, and amylase in there that breaks through exoskeletons and gets into it. These animals have found a way to like increase their sliminess or put a protective boundary between themselves and those enzymes enough to where that is their specialized habitat and they're found nowhere else on earth. But inside, that mosquito is only developed inside the purple pitcher plant water. Cool. Glad we got to share that with you guys. Yeah.